CyberSec TV flew to Athens to take you inside Cyber Eunovate 2025, Inisa's high-level event. The spotlight was on artificial intelligence, post-quantum cryptography, and the semiconductor supply chain. Experts from academia, industry and government shared how Europe can turn these strategic technologies into engines of trust, innovation and cyber resilience. We had the opportunity to talk to Apostolos Malatras from Anisa, who explained how Cyber Univate aims to strengthen Europe's cybersecurity market by securing products made in Europe and showing that regulation can drive innovation. Cyber Innovate is a new conference that ANISA is pioneering this year with the aim to stimulate the European cybersecurity market. For quite a few years, ANISA, together with the member states and the industry, are working together to come up with guidelines for securing different parts of the market. We need to coordinate now our efforts in order to, to push for a more secure EU market. And by secure EU market, I mean products that are made in Europe in order to make them competitive in the global market. The perception has been the case that cybersecurity is something that is costly. It's a compliance thing. We want secure products to advocate uh, the, the different values that the EU has to, 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 to bring on the table. Uh, we're living in a complex geopolitical environment. So the digital single market and the EU market, it does not live uh, in isolation but we have to compete with products from all over the world. Security is a key differentiator, and this is the, the, the message that we want to, to foster, to cultivate, that security products can be used to, to strengthen our infrastructures, to build our resilience, and to make sure that uh, the big ecosystem of SMEs and industries are competitive in a global environment. Clearly, we started with uh, artificial intelligence and post-quantum computing, where Europe has been traditionally strong, both in terms of rule setting and in terms of setting technical guidelines and standards, but also identified areas where there is a huge potential, such as software, both commercial and open source, as well as semiconductors, where Europe has traditionally had a lot of uh, big players. And now we have the emergence of chips everywhere. It's important to, to foster that market as well. Bart Preneel, professor at KU Leuven, warned that quantum computing will break today's cryptography and stressed the urgent need to migrate systems to post-quantum security. Well, quantum computing will develop, and this is a positive development because we'll actually be able to generate better medicine and more efficient computers. But there is also a downside to it. Quantum computers will be able to break our cryptography. And digital society today depends to a large extent on public cryptography to keep our communication secure and to make sure that our system updates are safe, that our systems stay in a safe state. Now, if quantum computers break the current systems, we have a very big problem. So we have to move to new systems and we call those post-quantum systems or quantum safe systems. This is a major development because there is about 60 billion of those devices, applications, and libraries. And in the next five to 10 years, they all have to be migrated. And that's a 10 year effort to upgrade all systems to make sure that they will be quantum safe in the future. In Europe, it's probably still multiple billions of systems. Um, and the problem is that it's to solve a long-term issue. So we have to upgrade today or in the next years because by 2040, a large quantum computer may be available, it will be able to decrypt all communications. So this is a long-term problem. And in general, industry is very bad at dealing with long-term problems that only will happen 10 or 15 years from now. So what will happen is it will be regulation that will force companies to upgrade. Why do they have to be forced? As I said, it's a long-term problem. It costs a lot of money and there is no direct benefit. If your product is upgraded, it will work the same. It will give you secure communications, but now long-term secure communications. But it doesn't look or feel different. So it's very hard to convince people to spend a lot of money to solve a future problem. But more or less, the target dates will be 2030 and 2035. That this moment is still a very big scramble because only very few things are ready or are available. One positive thing is, for example, TLS, transport layer security, and in most countries between 30 and 60 percent of all web traffic is already secure against those quantum computers. So there the migration has already uh, evolved very quickly but in many other places there is no migration whatsoever and the effort still has to be started. Even worse the awareness campaign has to be started. Players are not even aware that they have to do something. And this is a very large task for the next years. But I think it's important for Europe to invest in R&D and to keep investing in R&D in this area uh, but also invest in more applied work like creating open source software and hardware libraries, but also creating pragmatic testing labs where vendors can test 
interoperability of their products. And in general, it's important that uh, in public procurement, practical applications, the migration is encouraged as much as possible. Joanna Schwiontkowska from EXO underlined Europe's strength in diverse ecosystems and communities, but also pointed to an investment gap pushing startups abroad. My name is Joanna Schwiontkowska. I'm the Secretary General at EXO, European Cybersecurity Organization. So we discussed about innovation in Europe, uh, of course, from the perspective of cybersecurity. Why don't I underline two main themes that we uh, basically uh, contributed uh, to from the perspective of EXO. Uh, first and foremost, we do believe that innovation is all about uh, well-working ecosystems and communities. And we do believe that in Europe, this is one of our greatest strengths. We do have quite diverse uh, ecosystems, uh, different uh, communities, different stakeholders that if only come together and uh, work together can solve the most difficult issues that can lead to the meaningful innovation. So, and since EXO is all about communities, about empowering different stakeholders and different players, I think that this is what we do best. Uh, basically, we create, stimulate well-working environment when different stakeholders can work together and solve different issues from different perspectives. James Lovegrove from Red Hat highlighted open source as the backbone of modern IT and essential to building resilience. We talked about two or three um, key themes. The first was that uh, open source is the foundation of modern IT. The analogy which was used um, uh, on previous panels about moving from a floppy to uh, a cloud environment, it took taking decades, is now in the context of AI needing to be done within months. And there's no other solution out there or uh, ecosystem that can scale that kind of technology leap than, than open source. We also talked about the um, upstream collaboration responsibility when it comes to hardening resilience in projects, but also in downstream products. Uh, this importance of contributing back to the open source ecosystem, um, rigorous risk assessments, really vital to ensuring not only resilience, but also sustainability, because the business model then gives back uh, to the upstream, uh, which then further hardens and improves the best practices up there. The other point which um, sort of came out um, was uh, on regulatory front was about how you can incentivize that further. Um, how you can encourage companies to contribute upstream. You're talking about many, many manufacturers that already use open source, but getting them to contribute upstream. So who knows? It could be something like you know, um, uh, prioritizing the procurement of companies that do that when they're offering solutions in the public procurement. Um, and then there was a third uh, area where we talked about enterprise-grade uh, models for stability and trust. Uh, again, what that yielded was there is a need to improve some of the tooling out there. So again, Anissa can play a really good role here to channel a lot of this open source expertise and also expertise coming from the proprietary world um, who also rely on open source to improve those kinds of toolings and approaches and, and open standards when it comes to, to SBOM. So I think that's one of the, one of the tangible outcomes. Uh, and that maybe I can close by saying, of course, in the context of regulation, there's the upcoming CSA review. Maybe on the wish list of some, maybe all, many, um, is really giving ENISA more of a mandate, more resources uh, to do much more of this uh, technical data based uh, research and helping uh, understand better uh, the, the do's and the don'ts in terms of our global ecosystem. And I think secondly, which I think is really important, I can already see and he said, if I understand correctly, is moving towards becoming a, a route within the CVE system. I think that's really important that that's happening and that they can collaborate with other member states and CSERTs in showing that international leadership. Michael Osborne from IBM Quantum Safe emphasized that awareness remains the biggest challenge and called for aligning regulation with post-quantum migration. Panel was very good. It was very important. For me, the key takeaway was that we were all very aligned, coming from very different backgrounds. So I think there's two parts to industry. There's industry that needs components for their supply chain, and there's industry supplying the components. Not enough clients are asking we need this technology, we need PQC technology in our products. Businesses and enterprises really start talking to their suppliers and saying, this is important, we need this, when can we have it? I think uh, Europe is in a very strong position in, in the sense of CRA, with NIS2, with DORA. It actually provides a tremendous opportunity. You can in, in improve the cybersecurity resilience. At the same time, 
as taking these steps to becoming quantum safe. Uh, awareness is still a problem. Some industries know, some industries that employ cryptographers know, but there are many industries that don't. We saw today that there were very much um, gaps in awareness. There are things we can be doing to motivate the supply chain using uh, certification such that we're moving things in parallel rather than serial, and that will really help Europe. Guido Abate from ST Microelectronics noted that semiconductors lie at the heart of every digital product and called the Cyber Resilience Act an opportunity to raise security standards across the semiconductor supply chain. The panel discussion was about uh, the semiconductor supply chain challenges. Actually, it is quite an interesting one because the semiconductors are more or less everywhere in all the products that we uh, have used experience. The takeaways, I'd say, would be more about um, the complexity of the supply chain. No two semiconductor manufacturers are exactly uh, serving the, the same kind of customers with the same kind of products. So they are very diverse between them. But the CRA that we touched um, as a topic is uh, uh, something that will allow raising the level of the security for all of our products, especially the ones that are, uh, how to say, at the low security level. And its security, their security will be enhanced uh, thanks to the CRA. It's implementable for the semiconductor industry, so probably we will work on, on these aspects. But uh, the overall impression is, uh, I have to say, positive in what the CRA was to achieve. I think it was a great initiative, uh, something uh, that was necessary because we have actually here most of the industry that is tackling directly these, these questions, and it is important that we can cross-check between the different actors, our different views. Carlos Antunes from Portugal's NCC stressed that no member state can face AI and cybersecurity alone and called for a common European approach. We ended with, um, uh, we can say, a statement about the importance of working together as uh, in the regulation and how can we stand in the common market, trying to work not as separate countries, but working together. Uh, see our market as a common market for 500 million people. See, we have uh, giant states in the European Union. It's important to see that uh, cybersecurity and cybersecurity of AI and AI especially is something that we need to deal together. So we need to understand that we're not doing, cannot do it in a close way. So it's important to treat it uh, together and to understand that we cannot do it in isolated or just a vertical way. We close this special coverage of Cyber Innovate, organized by ANISA. Thank you for being with us and we look forward to the next edition.